Um, so I, for today's talk, I, I tried to categorize this into uh, four sort of super categories. Um, my basic four categories, and this all overlaps, they're all interchangeable and interdependent, they intermingle completely. But I tried to organize this just for the sake of a talk. Um, first of all, weather, which is always entertaining in Kansas City. Um, water, which I know a lot of you know a lot more about. And um, animals and people. Uh, people are certainly the largest and most complicated category, so we'll get to them. But let's start with weather. Um, Kansas City does have all the seasons. We don't always have them in the right and most predictable order. We do have all the extremes. Uh, if you were here yesterday, you experienced the heat. And uh, there are other times where you know it's 45 degrees one morning and 85 degrees the next day, and a couple days later it can snow. Uh, we call it whiplash weather, and it's never very dull for very long. My first weather item I want to talk about is ice. Um, the usual period of high risk of serious freezing here is from mid-October to mid-April. And normally we shut down most of our fountains uh, during October, except for Veterans Fountains, which we leave on until Veterans Day in November. We do have three fountains, including this one at Northland Fountain, uh, which are left on all winter to create ice sculptures whenever the weather is freezing. And when it's warmer, they just operate like north normal fountains. Um, these fountains do have a little higher maintenance issues with the freezing and the ice. Uh, sometimes the nozzles have to be replaced more often. The pipes might break a little more often. Also, if they uh, have a concrete base, and a couple of them do, the ice will bang against that exterior wall and cause some cracking and extra problems. Um, there's one of these three fountains in the south part of the city which has very significant uh, concrete damage, from, largely from the ice. Um, the rest of the fountains we turn on normally the second Tuesday of April, which is Fountain Day. And uh, this schedule misses most of the freezing weather, but now and then we will have a later frost or a later hard freeze, and that's when you get this. After the fountains have been turned on, if the ice builds up on the sculptures, it's actually pretty rare, um, but it does happen once in a while. This is from a couple of years ago. <clears throat> and, um, you know, you can imagine the weight of the ice does build up on certain things. It's not usually a problem, uh, but if anything has any kind of weak joint or weak seam, uh, sometimes between a patch, for instance, there was one fountain that had a a stone bowl that had been vandalized and the patch was damaged by the weight of the ice. And it didn't fall out right away, but it fell out the next year. But looking back at pictures, you could see that that crack uh, kind of developed after this ice event and got worse. Um, so taking that to the next step, our freeze-thaw cycle is really the biggest threat that we have for a lot of things in terms of weather here. Um, you know, it'll be warm and sunny in the day, daytime in the winter, and the ice and the snow will melt, and then that night it'll freeze again, and it gets into every little pore and every little pocket and crack, and um, sometimes you get this. It's especially a problem when you have a porous material like travertine. Um, this is supposedly a, a red Pakistani travertine on these bowls, and this is Seville Light Fountain. Uh, two of these bowls have cracked and fallen off, and a very patient conservator, uh, Gary, and uh, his assistant, had put this back together, and it was a daunting task and not, um, not an easy thing to do. But they did glue it all back together, and they had to use a lot of patching compound where necessary, where there wasn't enough material to fill. Um, hopefully they're in better condition now, but you know they'll never look the same. The patching will always be the, there. And they have continued to develop further cracks. Uh, the north and south bowls have not yet fallen off, but they to have some cracks in them. And you can see on the left, the white travertine has developed some pretty significant fissures. Um, so that's a little example of the freeze thaw. Uh, one more sculpture, two sculptures that we have that are really very interesting pieces. Um, we were just talking about these a little while ago. Uh, Adam and Eve at Loose Park. These are uh, uh, aggregate of marble chips in the you know, red concrete cast material, and you can see at the top, um, on the right, at the top of Adam's head, uh, the uh, red concrete had begun to degrade, and every little tiny pocket 
created a place for the water to get into, and the ice formed, and it just made those pockets bigger and bigger. And you can see in the bottom right, there's a crack in the arm, and there were a few other losses too. And the other bottom picture there is after it was restored. Uh, it was restored with a slurry coat to smooth and fill all of those little gaps and um, resurfaced. And now they look really very good. Um, they're quite stable now, I think. Um, Adam has a small problem with his broken right hand, which we have those fingers and we'll get them put back on. That's an old injury, an old patch that um, I think it's actually a really convenient place for kids to step when they're climbing on it. I think that's how that happened. Uh, wind is another weather issue. Sorry. Um, it's not a huge problem for most things, but we do have serious winds here. It's not unusual to have a 50, 60 mile an hour storm go through. And of course, we are in Tornado Alley and we could have a tornado. We've had microbursts in this area by this fountain. Um, this is Volker down by the Brush Creek. Uh, it includes four sculptures by Carl Millis. And the little angel up on the pedestal uh, is all his weight is standing on that one leg on that tall skinny pedestal. And he has this crack on the bottom right in his leg. Um, I think that that might be a casting flaw. Uh, originally, there was sort of a weld scar there in the very early pictures that I could find. But certainly the wind has aggravated this problem if it hasn't actually caused the crack to open up. It may be a freeze-thaw issue as well, um, probably a combination. But I think that the, the crack makes that um, a bigger threat in that location. I mean, he's somebody I really need to get him fixed soon. So lightning, I didn't take these pictures. I don't go out in lightning storm and take pictures. I got these off the internet. Somebody else went out. Um, it's, again, not the biggest problem in the world, but we do have a lot of power outages from lightning. Uh, just last week, we had a storm go through. This one on the right, I think, was actually a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, the power will go off, it'll come back on, and you get surges. Um, a lot of times the motors go on and off, and the uh, fountains don't really appreciate that so much. Uh, we did have a lightning strike right near Children's Fountain a couple weeks ago, and it blew out the fuses and seized up the motor. And the motor had to be pulled out and taken for repairs. Um, it happened right across the street at the same time at the water treatment plant. They had exactly the same problem. So uh, it was pretty easy to figure it was the lightning strike. So and yet, more generic pictures. <laughs> I love this fan. Um, if you were here yesterday, you know that's what that felt like. Uh, we do get these ridiculously hot days. And again, heat's not probably the biggest problem for a fountain per se, except for a couple of things. Um, first of all, if the heat can melt or soften the asphalt in the street, you know it's probably playing havoc with caulk. And a lot of our fountains depend heavily on caulk because it's the tiniest thing, but it makes the biggest difference in the world. And so it softens, and that's a problem. Also, things expand, of course. And the other thing from a conservator's perspective is uh, you can't touch the bronze when it's that hot, so we don't do any conservation work for the most part in the summers. Usually most of our conservation is done in the spring and fall. Uh, my next super category is water. Um, of course water is required for a fountain, but waters, the fountain's own water is really responsible for many of the biggest challenges in maintaining a fountain. First of all, there's just the sheer force of it, the impact. Um, in this case, the water landing, the jets land on the bronze and on the stone rim of the interior bowl. Um, this is J.C. Nichols, it has a lot of water power, big nozzles, big sprays. Uh, and it, it varies depending on the water pressure, so that doesn't always land in exactly the same spot, which is good, but it does cause some wearing on the sculptures. Um, also, the other thing about the high pressure water is, of course, the pipes are occasionally going to burst. Um, you get a lot of wear and tear on the seams and the joints. The other fun thing about water is rust. Any ferrous metal anywhere, even in the vicinity of a fountain, will rust. I think that somehow the fountains can find metal that nobody even knows is there. Um, pipes, grates, uh, pipe supports, pumps, anything that has any kind of ferrous metal or rust. And that rust, of course, will travel. On the right, you can see at Eagle Scout the, the staining in the stone um, that is caused by that rust. It also 
leaves deposits on the sculptures. Uh, you can see on the, on the right, especially, you can see where the water line is on the bronze. Um, that's partly rust deposits and partly some other things, dirt. Uh, and also on the upper left, um, the staining in the background on J.C. Nichols is the rust in, in the water. And also the bronze finishes get worn off quite a lot, quite quickly, by the power of the water as well. So here's my story about caulk. Um, the upper left picture, if you can see it, the very tiny little cracks um, underneath the capstone, just barely you can see them. And this is after the fountain had been uh, caulked and waterproofed on the bottom, and the walls were waterproofed, but the contractor missed these little seams, a whole bunch of them. And it's about the water line, so I think he probably didn't think it was important. But you can see there's a lot of wave action, and even the capstone has gotten splashed on. And the bottom picture below that is what happens. That water found every one of those little cracks and traveled underneath the capstone and out over the wall and out onto the sidewalk, just from those tiny little cracks. Um, the upper right is the caulk actually blowing out and the water squirting out sideways out of the seam. And, um, and at the bottom is uh, the mortar just raining down and, and leaching out of the mortar seam under the capstone and, and actually etching the granite on that fountain. Concrete, there's a saying with concrete, concrete cracks. It also spalls. The minerals leach out of it. And essentially, it can just dissolve in the face of this constant onslaught of water and ice. On the bottom left is one of the fountains that's left on in the winter. Um, and that's damage from the ice as well as the water. And of course, it gets in there, soaks into the concrete, and freezes and thaws. And that whole fountain needs to basically be completely rebuilt. That's half, uh, Delbert Half Fountain. Uh, water quality, the constant balancing act. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, algae uh, is a constant uh, issue trying to maintain the water quality, keep the balance of the chemicals and the, and the um, heat and everything else. Of course, it gets up on the stone and grows very nicely on some of the stone sculptures, and um, cleaning that off is a fairly constant effort as well. So my third super category is animals. Um, I love this Robin, he's adorable. And it's hard to begrudge any critter a drink on a hot day. Uh, some of our fountains work just fine as bird baths. Um, of course, animals can also do some harm and leave a mess. This is, uh, it was really pretty impressive when you saw all the geese standing around Meyer Circle Fountain. They stood on the rim and it was like sculptures, they were beautiful, and then they left and this is what was left behind. <laughs> And there are some fountains around Brush Creek you can't even walk around because of the, the goose droppings. It's, it's really a mess. And of course that adds to our trouble with the water quality. Um, these geese on the left are in J.C. Nichols Town. And I've heard from some of the conservators I've worked with about the special properties of squirrel urine on bronze. That's always uh, a little bit of a problem too. But I have to say, as much trouble as they cause to the fountains and um, annoyance to people, the fountains are actually uh, at least as big a threat or bigger threat really to the animals. In many cases, uh, the fountains are generally 18 inches, two, two feet deep. They almost all have a straight vertical side. And when little birds get in that don't swim, they can't get out. Uh, if they get in any deeper water, they can't, can't get out and they will drown. Um, you'll also find uh, other animals, critters, uh, squirrels, possums, raccoons, um, mice, rats, all kinds of things can get into the fountains and drown. And if the water is not in the fountain, they might jump in for a drink out of a little puddle at the bottom in the wintertime, and then they can't jump back out again either. Um, I'm not going to show you any pictures of what the results of that are. Um, if you want more details, you can talk to Jonathan in the back there. So my fourth super category is people, and this is by far the biggest category. I put these pictures in from the internet again, um, just to show that it's not only us. People play in fountains everywhere. You can see the Eiffel Tower in the background. Um, I especially like the guy on the right who's doing a dive into water that is knee-deep on some people in the background. So the first aspect of people considerations are the political issues and budgets. Um, several years ago, for instance, people in the Northland felt that they were not included in the city of fountains because they didn't have any city on fountains north of the river. Um, that's the area we call the Northland. And 
they lobbied and raised funds and launched a huge campaign and they actually ended up with two fountains. The first one that I showed you with the ice is one of theirs. That's the Northland fountain. And then this is also a children's fountain, very popular in the Northland. They're very possessive and very attached to the fountain. And of course, um, that's sort of true everywhere. People want a fountain in their area, in their neighborhood, or their part of the city. As, well, as much as people love the fountains, and we have the fountains as our logo and our city slogan, um, the fact is there's still always a lot of competition for funding. Of course, there's a lot of other issues in the city, and um, the fountains are not generally funded. Uh, to, well, of course, nothing is funded to the degree anybody wants it to be. But uh, 10 years ago, we had $500,000 for our annual budget for maintenance and for conservation and restoration. Um, over the last 10 years, it dwindled from 500 to 250,000 and then to exactly zero. And um, this year, we're back up to 250,000, so we're kind of, um, we have high hopes for that. Um, but it's not nearly going to cover all the needs that we have for the year. We've actually just launched a huge fundraising campaign with the City of Fountains Foundation, which is a support group, and the Parks Department together have uh, launched a, we had a big festival of fountains a couple weeks ago. And uh, so far, that's already netted us um, one donation of $133,000 for Eagle Scout Fountain, which was exciting. And um, the, unfortunately, though, you know, it'll never be enough uh, funding from city government because there's always so many other competition um, things to compete with. So the design decisions are fundamental to everything that comes after the fountain um, for the rest of its life. We have some very simple fountains, uh, just a couple left, like the one on the left that, um, I think we have three left like this, maybe two, that are flow through design. Um, very simple, the water comes in, the water goes out. There is no pumps, there's no electrical system, there's no recirculating system. Uh, it's a lot easier to maintain in a lot of ways. Uh, it's also um, I call it, it's blissfully simple or a catastrophic waste of water, depending on your perspective. Um, the water department doesn't like us to do this. Most people would never design a fountain anymore in the future, and from now forward, that uh, doesn't recirculate. On the other hand, you have very complicated computerized display, um, a block fountain, uh, a huge pump room with all kinds of equipment and computers that manage a totally, a constantly varying display. The location is another big issue, um, partly a design decision, partly a political decision. Um, fountains in medians and traffic circles are pretty popular around here, actually. Uh, and I think in most places, because they can be seen very easily, but they can't be seen very well. It's very hard to walk up to it. Uh, most people drive by this fountain and have no idea what it's called. Um, some people didn't even know that it was a fountain because it was turned off for so many years. When we restored it, the people were asking, what, what is that? What's the name of it? Um, obviously, access to a site in the median of the street is a difficult issue sometimes. Um, there's worker safety to be considered. Uh, there are also some other issues with being close to the um, snow removal. This one's not too close to snow, but the snow will get piled up on the concrete sidewalk. There's a couple of other fountains that are actually closer than that to the street, and this, the salt uh, that they put down for the snow, and then they shovel the snow and shoot it up onto the sculpture sometimes or into the fountain. Uh, so that can be an issue. Um, this is American War Mothers. It's obviously pretty vulnerable to cars. It has been hit three times in the last eight years, uh, before the renovation, after the renovation. But both times you can see that little stone wall perimeter uh, was able to stop the car. Um, however, the third time the car went airborne over that little stone wall <laughs> and changed the name of the fountain to the Amer American War Mothers Car Wash. This is our new nickname for it. And it's one of my very favorite pictures. Um, <coughs> Fortunately, that's as good as it could get if this is going to happen. Uh, he landed up alongside the column, but he didn't hit the column. Uh, tiniest little scratch, that's it. Uh, the back wheels hooked up on the other wall, so he didn't continue through to the other side and blast out the wall. Um, he did, however, leave a mess. Uh, oil and transmission fluid soaked into the limestone um, and in the water. The tiles were popped off the interior of the wall and there were some chips, but really all in all, uh, I don't think you could ask for a better result if you're really gonna have to hit a fountain with a car. So vault design is another big issue. Um, 
the fountain with the two red travertine bowls that fell off, the Seville White Fountain, uh, this is what's underneath it. And this is why that fountain has not operated since I took these pictures in 2005. Um, you can see on the left, very far in the back, is Kevin. He's getting at the sump pump in there, trying to pull out the sump pump and get it fixed so that all that flooding in the floor could drain out. Um, this vault is four feet wide, five feet tall, and 20 feet long. So if you are more than five feet tall, you can't even stand up straight in there. Um, the panels, all the uh, blue boxes on the right, those are the electrical boxes, all rusty from water draining through them from the fountain above and also from uh, rainwater coming in through the one vent uh, at the front by the ladder, which is where all the, it was usually uh, mulch from the flower bed that would clog the sump pump and cause it to flood. There was also leaking pipes and you can see the stalactites on the ceiling, uh, which is the floor of the fountain. Uh, from the water draining through from the fountain above. Um, this is just one, this is probably the worst vault, honestly, that we have. Um, but there are some others that are also old, not up to the modern safety standards, modern codes. Um, for instance, there's no extra ventilation in this, and the access is just absurd. If anybody had any kind of a problem or an issue at that far back corner of this, it would not get out. Um, we have another vault that's much larger than this, and has a much bigger water display, and the pipe burst uh, like two minutes after somebody got out of the vault, and it filled the entire vault in seconds. So if anything like that happened, it would be a pretty bad disaster. We're trying to get vaults redesigned and rebuilt in newer ways. This is a fairly new vault, and uh, you can see much better doors. <coughs> um, the safety doors that lock open, and then when they're closed, they're watertight. Uh, there's second ventilation, backup systems, a lot more space inside, a much better plan. And also for vaults, for small fountains, they don't even need to be on the ground. All the equipment can be accessed from a pit on top of the ground. Um, I'm not going to dwell on construction methods and quality, um, but I just wanted to include it mm, primarily to say it's, it's not done by magic, it's all done by people. And people aren't ever going to be perfect, and some of them are less perfect than others. And some of the quality that we've gotten on some of the construction has not been what we would um, have really liked. Um, this one had problems from the very beginning, and um, we covered it up with tile, which also had very big problems, and basically all needs to be done over. The, the real learning experience from, from that one is to be more specific in our um, requirements of proof of expertise in construction um, before people are hired. Um, vandalism, theft, abuse, everybody has stories about public art theft around the world. It's not new, it's gotten worse and probably more sophisticated, certainly. Um, the Parks Department's tallied up about a million dollars, just over a million dollars of um, metal theft in the last six years. Uh, 215,000 of that was from fountains and monuments and uh, that includes plaques and the lights from Women's Leadership Fountain and several others. Uh, they were pried right out of the concrete, and the nozzles were all stolen out of Firefighters Fountain and several others. Um, malicious mischief vandalism. People have knocked over the Harold Rice Fountain twice in the last three years or four years. Uh, fortunately, it's a stock statuary store concrete fountain. It's pretty easy to replace. Um, on the right is uh, just one, inch of, one image of skateboard damage. Um, any wall or staircase, skateboarders are going to love it. Uh, they actually pry all the skate stoppers that have been put there and pry them out of the, out of the concrete. There are websites on how to do that. And uh, that's wax soaked into the concrete and has metal shavings in it as well. Mm. Observation Park Lion. He makes me sad. <laughs> Uh, 1899, he was a beautiful big carved lion, and uh, all this beautiful carving around him. He's in the base of a 22-foot high wall, and um, you can see even in the original uh, 1899 photograph, there's already a little chip in the basin. By 1999, he was pretty much a ruin. Um, people had thrown rocks at him and beat on him and clogged the pipes, pulled the pipes out. Uh, spray paint and spray paint removal pretty much finished him off. So we were able to pull it out during a major restoration, reproduce it in clay, and then have it cast in cast stone, and a new bowl was made. It 
really beautiful for a little while. And then people threw rocks at it again. And you can stand on top of the wall and drop a rock down into the bowl. That's fun, um, apparently. And uh, he's pretty chipped up and banged up again. The water's also clogged up. The pipes are clogged. He makes me sad. I worked on that for 11 years. It took two years to thrash it again. <coughs> so this one is interesting. In the circle, you can see kind of brown splotch on the floor of the fountain. Um, this is downtown. And that brown splotch is the staining left over from a chemical that was dumped into the water last fall before the fountain was drained. Um, on the bottom is the brand new pump that was green about two months before that. And uh, the valve on the right is one of three that was rusted into a useless chunk of metal. Uh, this was probably caused by meth amphetamine lab refuse that somebody dumped into the fountain. And I just include this, um, if any of you are working in public spaces, learn about meth byproduct and what it looks like, what it could look like, and don't touch it. Um, our guy was really lucky that he was able to survive what he did cleaning this out. He could have hurt himself. I'm sure it wasn't good for the pipes. Um, this cost us about $12,000 in extra damage uh, to replace and repair. Graffiti vandalism is not new. You've all probably seen this in many forms. Um, Eagle Scout Fountain, this is the uh, pink granite night sculpture. She got extra lipstick and some toenail polish, courtesy of some tempera paint just a few weeks ago. And fortunately, it was pretty easy to wash out, most of it. Um, now on the right, I put in the Scout. He's not a fountain, I'm sorry. But he is an icon of Kansas City. And when he had uh, oil-based alkyd paint dumped on him a few years ago, um, we were very lucky that the Adopt Monument group sponsors his constant upkeep and care, and he had been recently waxed. In case any of you haven't heard, it's a good thing to wax your bronze. And uh, that helped save him. And uh, Jonathan was able to come in a couple weeks later and put on a new coat of wax, and he was okay. Um, happy face. He's cute. It's chalk on limestone, and it actually came off pretty well. Um, it says shop at Walmart there at the bottom, so I figured that's where they got their chop. Hey. Public perceptions and attitudes, another subcategory. Um, like I said, everybody wants a fountain in their part of the city. Everybody wants a fountain in their neighborhood, or they want to be involved in a fountain. People love having fountains nearby. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about psychology of um, the attitudes and everything. And this may not sound relevant necessarily to the sort of tangible conservation issues that you might deal with, but um, when you get a panic-stricken call from somebody like me saying, something's got to be fixed and it's got to be done by such and such a date and it's a crisis and it's an emergency, this is kind of how that can happen. I like this quote, uh, water like time has the power to cleanse and heal. This memorial fountain stands as a symbol of that healing. I think that just kind of indicates some of the power that people invest in the fountains. Uh, they get very attached um, to fountains. They're often our fountains are dedicated to a person or an event or a group of people, in this case Vietnam veterans. And the main challenge here is living up to the expectations people have for that site. Um, of course, a memorial site should be perfect all the time, and people who are attached to it consider it disrespectful when it's not. Another big emotional issue is weddings. People love to get married at fountains. That is a drop-dead date you cannot change. So if that fountain needs fixing, it's got to be done by June 16th. Um, fountain days, uh, this is another whole issue. Um, neighborhood pride, uh, neighborhood unity. Another big reason people like their fountains, the one on the bottom uh, left, that's fountain day and the dedication for the restored fountain. Uh, the neighborhood pushed very hard for that and they were very involved in it and it would not have happened without them. Um, of course, it had a very tight deadline. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention there is, is that for a lot of our history, we've had to approach maintenance as a kind of crisis management thing. Um, we're trying to get ahead of that right now and set up a better system. We've reorganized our crew so we have a more dedicated crew to some of the fountain maintenance and um, set up a little bit better long-term planning, uh, short-term planning, a little bit more of a schedule. 
but traditionally, yeah, it's been very much crisis management and um, living up to these expectations that people have uh, for various films with very tight deadlines usually. Another thing, this honestly I have to say mystifies me. People love to see the fountains dyed colors. Um, we have dyed the fountains all sorts of different colors for different requests. Uh, we've had requests to dye them for events, from, this is pink from Breast Cancer Awareness Month, the whole month of October. Um, the blue is for Royals Day, the opening day of the baseball team. Uh, we usually only dye six or seven at a time. Um, we even recently had a request to dye in black, which I hope was deemed infeasible. I'm not sure how that turned out. But the main challenge with this, well, one of the main challenges with this is when do you say no? Once you've started, uh, how do you say no to the next group that wants to come and do this? Um, if we said yes to everybody, they'd be dyed all the time. So another challenge is how to achieve this, the right color uh, when they dye them purple. The, it turned kind of gray in the funnel, so they weren't happy. And I think the other challenge is how to, how to get that color right. You can get it pink in the sprays, but then you have this very shocking red in the bowls and the basins, and that's kind of jarring. Um, we have a company that makes these dyes for us, and they all assure us that there's no harm to the fountain. Um, of course, then it's removed with bleach, and then another chemical to, to neutralize the bleach. Um, so if anybody here has any ideas about the ways this might be causing any harm to our fountains, I'd really like to talk to you. Um, another big issue we have is swimming pools, hot tubs. Everybody thinks that uh, the fountains are basically a free place to play. It's a swimming pool, hot tub, bathtub, uh, play area. I did not take a picture of the guy bathing in this fountain. I thought that would be rude, but you can use your imagination here too. Uh, that little space between the columns, where the water is cascading down, it's a great spot for a shampoo. He just dropped his clothes on the sidewalk and hopped in and lathered up and got out. And, uh, you know, it's not just the people who live in the park or who should know better but don't. This is the Missouri Department of Tourism. <laughs> they did this on purpose. They actually came out and had us turn the fountain back on, which apparently somebody did. Um, they ran this ad and a whole bunch of things. So it just sort of reflects the attitude of the playground. The, the fountains are kind of a play area for people. Uh, I probably, I don't know if I've run over, but this is my last couple slides. Um, just to uh, illustrate one of our successes, because we do occasionally have successes, uh, at least to some degree. This is Women's Leadership Fountain a few years ago. Um, when it was about 110 years old, it looked like this, and it leaked, and it was turned off, and it was a mess. Um, the entire block, including the fountain, was restored. A huge fundraising a capital campaign was raised. We actually sold property to raise the funds for this, and uh, spent about $3 million. We were able to recreate the balustrades that had been missing for ages. Uh, from the old drawings, which were in our archives, and we do have a wonderful archive of old, uh, old drawings. And um, it is now again the beautiful entrance, north entrance to the Paseo from the north part of the city. And um, it was a, a major project, but we were finally able to get it all restored. Of course, this is where the happy face was uh, on the bollard, and, uh, or on the finial and also where the lights were stolen, and it's a very popular bathtub. But it's still beautiful, and the lights uh, have all been replaced in the fountain, and the lights around the fountain have been recreated, and it's, uh, it's our big success. Um, so that's my very quick overview of uh, the major challenges that we have um, in the city of fountains, and um, thank you for bearing with me. Jocelyn for a, a very interesting overview of fountains and their meaning in Kansas City and the kind of problems you run into when you're a city manager and I think part of the importance of this this, this particular conference is going to be to uh, work out how how best we can sort of deal with the problems and manage them in a, in a more controlled way perhaps uh, does anybody have questions for Jocelyn Right, I'm
clock, so I don't really know. No, you did a great job. I, went for the rest. I, don't know. I had a couple questions. Sure. So the fountains that you choose to be ice sculptures, mm -hmm. how did you decide which ones that you were going to is there something about the fountain itself that lends itself to doing that, or it's yeah. less likely to be damaged by the ice? Or no, <laughs> <laughs> I would say first of all, mostly it's a geopolitical consideration. There's one in the Northland, one in the old Northeast area, and one in the south part of the city, um, just to spread them equally. Is that something people ask for that they? I think originally it probably was that even the children's fountain with the little children on the pedestals. Um, that was originally left on. But it was doing a lot of damage to the pedestals, uh, which is still there and hasn't really been fixed. But at least they recognized it was doing damage and they stopped doing that many years ago. Um, I think the Half Fountain, uh, Delbert Half Fountain, which is in the south on 63rd Street, or Meyer Boulevard, sorry, um, it has been very severely damaged by the ice. And I'm kind of trying to lobby quietly to get that stopped. Uh, we don't have that many freezing days in the, in the winter where you really get wonderful ice sculptures. I think, you know, time passed, people talk about how it used to get a lot colder here in the winter and it's not getting that cold anymore. So I think if we redesigned some of the elements around that fountain, we might be able to, to have like an overflow, uh, like a swimming pool, you know, where the wave action can s spill over or something like that um, and do something better to, to accommodate that. But right now it's just a vertical concrete wall and it's just eaten away. Um, so I can't say that it's um, because of the way they're designed that they were chosen. Uh, there is one, the Concourse Fountain, uh, which is flat, and it, you know it's the jets that come up out of the out of the pavement. So that ice has in, kind of infinite area to just expand and keep moving and doesn't really do a lot of harm. And when it melts, it soaks back through the grates and the drains. Interesting. Okay. And then um, the American War Mothers. I noticed in one of the photographs that it had been surrounded by a grass lawn and you paved that over. What, yes. What was the thought behind that? Uh, there were a couple of considerations there. Partly um, the mowing of that lawn was doing more damage to that wall. They kept Interesting. mowers. I didn't even include mowers. Mowers are my nightmare. They bang into everything. They use sculptures as pivot points and they just hang around the corner. And so they are a lot of um, chips and damage. It actually knocked some rocks out of that wall. Plus, um, it's just kind of a ridiculous place to have to go out and mow this one little tiny strip of grass in the middle of the street. Um, also, I think it was causing some water issues with the ponding and the puddling and the grass was very uneven. When we paved it over, uh, it turned out the street was just enough of a slope to, to match the curb line. It just drained very nicely all the way away from the fountain and away from that wall. So. Uh, it, was, it was just a little yeah. easier, you know, yeah. a little less maintenance to take care of. And my last question is, um, <coughs> in the areas where you've had um, metal theft, mm -hmm. do you, how do you handle that? Do you replace the plaque or, I mean, thinking, usually, yeah. usually we would just, um, some of the things uh, that we've tried to do is, is not use bronze anymore. Um, wherever we possibly can, uh, we've used a few other materials. Silex is a acrylic kind of compound. It looks very much like stone. You can make it look really nice like granite. Um, I haven't tried it to make it look like bronze. I got some samples one time, but we decided to go with a different um, material, which was a sort of thin sheet of aluminum that was printed to look like dark bronze with gold lettering. And when that was mm, mounted on top of an acrylic sheet, um, it probably would have held up OK, except for the fact that it had to be done in two pieces because the, the bronze plaques we were replacing were seven feet long wow. and they couldn't roll it all out in one piece. And to do those in bronze was going to be $75,000 for four plaques. So we did them this way, hoping for the best, and the heat immediately expanded the acrylic backing and the, the seam kind of spread apart. So I don't consider that a great success, but on the other hand, the text is there and people can read it and it looks fine from any distance five feet away, you can't really see it. Um, I don't think it's a permanent solution, so. But there's not really a way to um, attach the, the plaques and the, and the elements so that they can be. There are better ways and less better ways, um, but it seems like the people that really want them will get them. Um, but a lot of, honestly, a lot of the things that have been stolen were easy because uh, some of the plaques, for instance, the Benton plaque that was stolen, there were two on either side of a rock. And when our guys went out to get the other one um, on the back side of the rock that wasn't stolen, 
all he had to do was just pull it off because the mortar was 95 years old. Oh, wow. And hey, you know what? So that's a, one of a, my other missions is to have everything inspected more frequently and check. And I tell all our maintenance guys, whenever you're in a park, just go tug on the plaque and see if it's secure. Because a lot of things have been there for 80, 90, 100 years. Um, and it doesn't take that long for mortar to fail. So. Um, but yet, more recently, things you can epoxy them down and, and use a lot better a secure system. And then I, just one last thought. I, I'm sure there's no money for this, but do you ever work with um, community groups on education? So I'm assuming a lot of this vandalism is younger people and... You know, and, and I think that one of the things the city's tried to do is um, get after the recycling centers for paying people for this stuff. Oh, okay. And uh, they passed some ordinances and things like that. It doesn't seem to have slowed it down very wow. much. And just in terms of kids, like the skateboarders and maybe the people putting lipstick and that sort of yeah. thing, um, any kind of educational efforts to... Yeah, we do a lot of those kinds of things all the time, um, sort of community groups, meetings, church groups, things like that. I do a lot of talk. But um, yeah, there's just always more. And honestly, I, um, when I was doing some research on this skateboard issue, the, I was kind of stunned at the, the stuff on the internet about how we have the right to skate wherever we want, and the city's just being so mean to us, um, and, and it's not fair. And, and it's like their God-given right to skate on anything they want. And, and that's a difficult attitude to change. You know, people, you really have to get in there. And there were even architects who are now on the flip side, grew up as skateboarders and are now designing stuff um, on the internet saying, you know, oh, okay, I used to skate on things and now I wish people wouldn't. But you just kind of have to grow into that. and. Um, some people in other words, it's called do. maturity. Yeah, <laughs> nobody does. Yeah, everybody doesn't always come to the same conclusion, I guess, on that sort of thing. But we, we do put in skate stoppers, and we do. Um, we're going to do another a, a whole onslaught of stuff. That that fountain where that skate damage is uh, is the one we just got a large donation for, and um, fixing some of the skating damage is actually a big part of why they gave us the donation. Oh, that's great. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Do you have a method in which you use to prioritize what restoration is going to be next on the list, be it restoring the art, restoring the workings of the fountains, so because what comes first, the art? Or I have. <laughs> um, as a, a, an art student, I prioritize the artwork. I think that, I mean, that's the unique thing. You can buy a pump next year if you have to. It doesn't matter, but if the sculpture is damaged or the sculpture is lost, um, you know, that's just not as easily replaced and frequently isn't replaceable at all. Um, so, yeah, my priority is usually on protecting the sculpture or the unique aspects of the fountain. Um, that's not always everybody else's priority. Uh, most people just want to be able to drive by and see that water on. And so our maintenance guys, and like I said, we have this $250,000 pot that we share. So it's a little bit of a race to see who can spend it first. Um, but, you know, the fountains, the pumps, that's what they are, they're water. So a lot of people just want the water on and they want to see it clear and they want to see it running. Um, finding a small crack in the Volker Fountain Angel, nobody notices that. So getting that to be a priority is, is a little difficult. Does that answer that? Well, yeah, it does. But some of the fountains that I have, granted, the, the art will eventually, is starting to be damaged. However, continuing running the, the pumps and motors and all, it goes back to what you had said earlier, that water pressure is causing damage. So if I fix that so that that water pressure is consistent, I'm causing more damage to the art than everything else. So it's like, I need to fix the water first and then I can take care of the art. Sure. I guess I just look at it the other way. That's true. Yeah, I guess it depends on what's causing the damage. Um, you know, if the water or the functioning of the fountain is causing the damage to, to anything else, you're right, that would have to be fixed first. Um, if it's just uh, freezing and thawing and, and ice and wind, um, I would probably try to take care of the sculpture first. But it's not up to me frequently. A lot of the time it's, it's that's another political consideration, for instance. I might think that Fountain X over here is the most urgent thing and it needs the most help, but that's not the one that somebody donated money for. So I go do the one that somebody donated the funds for and Seville Light, for instance, we've had a number of people with petitions and they really, really want us to fix that fountain, but there's no money. 
and of course we have to go do the ones that we can afford to do. Um, and it's curious, sometimes you think, why would they donate money to one fountain instead of another when the other one needs it more? But that goes back to the emotional attachment people have to fountains and the groups that are there to support. Obviously the veterans groups are there to support veterans fountains. Uh, neighborhood groups will support a neighborhood fountain and they really won't work very hard to support a fountain in another part of the city. And, and so there's a, there's a lot of that kind of you know, jockeying. The, the, do you, is there a group within the city that goes to get these donations or how is, what is that all? Yeah, we have a, an organization called the City of Fountains Foundation, which has been a sort of a support organization for 40 years. We just had their 40th anniversary. That was the fountain festival that we just had. Um, it was part of their celebration. And they seized that opportunity to launch this big fundraising campaign. Um, traditionally, they've been more of a, a moral support organization. So the last few years, they've really tried to ramp up their um, financial support and their fundraising efforts. And, and that's been a really interesting trend and a, a really nice new uh, development. Um, we also have the Adopt a Monument group, uh, which is uh, born out of the uh, Save Outdoor Sculpture um, inventory that was done in the early 90s. And uh, they've recently merged together with the City of Fountains Foundation, so we have all of our monument conservation effort and, um, and fountain conservation effort in the same, same group right, right now. And so they were working together on, on all of that uh, fundraising and the festival. Uh, one of the things they're doing all summer is they're having what they're calling a splash mob. Every so many weeks they'll have a Saturday event at a fountain to have a press conference and raise money and talk about that fountain. And they have some art students that have created a, a sort of paint by numbers mural and a section of that will be at each of these fountains and then people will color in that section that day and then by the end of the summer, theoretically, that should be all assembled into a large mural and I think they're going to put it up at the school or someplace. Mm -hmm. okay. So that'll be kind of fun. There was another question over there, I think. Yes, I found it intriguing that um, groups who have won their fountains die. Um, can you elaborate a little more on uh, how often that happens and what the uh, what your perception is uh, long term to the fountains? Well, like I said, um, so far everybody has told me that it doesn't cause any permanent damage. Can you hear me if I just yell, or should I go back over here? Yeah. Um, so far, nobody has really been able to show that it causes permanent damage, but I'm not sure how carefully anybody's really checked. Um, and it is, uh, uh, we do it like different groups will do annually. Sometimes it's a one time thing. The breast cancer awareness is every October. Um, the Royals Blue, I think that we do that every year, but I'm not sure. Um, other groups, sometimes it's just a one time event, like they're having a, a marathon race or something. Um, honestly, I don't even know who the purple was for. Uh, the black request was for. Um, a melanoma society. Their color is black. That was gross. But anyway, <laughs> pardon my editorializing. But I think that would look kind of apocalyptic, and so I, I've kind of lobbied against it. But yes. Uh, I know architecturally, a lot of people, a lot of times, you'll see colors from the light. So if it were any way possible to shift people's uh, expectation into the evening or night, yes. then you could use lighting and do anything. Yes, we actually are trying to do that with a couple of fountains. Um, again, obviously the thing is you don't get the color in the daytime. Uh, the J.C. Nichols fountain is one that we've looked at, especially that's very popular. It's always dyed. Whenever we dye the fountains, that's one that is always the key fountain. Um, and uh, we had to put in all new lighting not too long ago. We put in LED lighting with the plan that we could add um, gels to it and change the colors. Um, the original lighting was all stolen. So when we got the opportunity to put new lights back in, we actually could only put in half as many as we need. So we still have to go back and add another whole slew of lights to that fountain. It's very dark. Um, but lighting through, changing the color of the, of the fountain through the lights is definitely something we've looked at. It's just that you can't see it in the daytime and that's what people are attached to right now. I think you're right, it's something that people could learn to like and learn to appreciate um, more. I also meant to ask when you um, mentioned dying, at least it used to be, and obviously I'm not involved with a lot of fountains, it used to be a, a, a very popular kind of vandalism to soak detergent and yeah. dye fountains. Is that still going on? It, it, it happens occasionally. 
Honestly, I don't see it as often. Um, I think our maintenance guys probably see it and I don't hear about it, maybe. It does happen. Um, most of the soap in the fountains is there for bathing. People actually leave bars of soap on some fountains to come back and take it back tomorrow. Not for soap. Yeah, it's not just for show. <laughs> yeah. Is soap is still water treated? Yes, the water is, is treated with a whole variety of chemicals, and I'm not even um, going to try to tell you how they do it and what they do. But um, I know when, when the dyes are put into the fountain, then they have to put the extra chlorine in it. But there's always chlorine in the fountain. There's other chemicals they use. I think muriatic acid is used at least in swimming pools. Um, and, and the results of all of those chemicals um, are not always completely successful. You know, sometimes they're <coughs> the chlorine. For instance, when we, we try to get away from ferrous metals for a while, they used aluminum for some grates and things like that. Well, that doesn't like chlorine at all. So the combinations of things um, have been a real issue. And you know, you, you've got these guys going around in, in sort of a stopgap mode, trying to fix something fast. Uh, there's a lot of band-aid work that gets done. And so the measuring and the exact proportions of things hasn't always been monitored perfectly. So, right. <laughs> You had a question? I had the same question. Oh, same question. Okay. Uh, Justin, can you remind us how many sculptures you, uh, how many fountains you're in charge of and how big your maintenance team is? Uh, yeah, we have 47 fountains. Um, our maintenance team, I think, is three or four guys. And right they now. do other things. And they do other things, yeah. So we are reorganizing them, and the, um, they're, they're out of our facility maintenance or facility maintenance division. So they take care of all of our buildings as well and other stuff. Um, so they've sort of tried to separate a, a slightly more dedicated crew just for the fountains and monuments. Um, it's not all settled yet. There's a constant reorganization. But they're um, under Parks and Rec? And they're in Parks and Rec, yeah. There's two fountains that are maintained by the City Hall um, uh, General Services Division, which are the City Hall Seahorse uh, Fountains and uh, the Barney Alice Fountain at the Convention Center. Are your maintenance crew um, adding the chemicals and doing the... Yes. Chemistry. For the most part, yeah. We have some maintenance um, contracts for a few things, and there are a few fountains that have um, donated, like somebody's adopted it and they do all the maintenance, like the Muse of the Missouri Fountain, the Kemper Fountain uh, downtown. That is adopted by the, the Kemper Family uh, Trust uh, and Commerce Bank, which the Kemper family owns. And so they do all the maintenance on that. Uh, for the last seven or eight years, they've taken that on. Um, which has really been a, a big help, and they've done a really nice job. It's just um, there's so much more to do, so they're still incrementally attacking the different issues. But they reworked a lot of the site and the stone and, and the fountain basins and the lighting and all of that, and now they're working on the pedestal, on the, on the sculpture, which is a, um, about a 30-foot tall bronze piece in the middle of the street, so it's a difficult site. Um, it was going to be in my pictures, but I thought I had to cut it because I didn't have time. It's a quick thing, um, so, why is it divided up um, between the modern, between the monuments and the fountains? Is it the mechanics that uh, puts uh, Just, fountains into the parks department while the monuments or statues are? Oh, uh, we take care of all the monuments too. Um, all of the historic, anything historic, um, is all in parks department. Uh, the new pieces, like when we get a new piece of public art, that usually comes through the Public Art Commission, um, and they're not necessarily on park property. Sometimes they'll be in different city buildings around the city. Um, right now we're working on a combined project with the new art, and it'll be at Firefighters Memorial Fountain, which is a very um, passionately guarded fountain. Of course, the firefighters are very involved, and it's got two really nice sculptures that are already very popular. So putting in a new piece of art there is kind of an interesting, sensitive subject. Um, so we're working with the Public Art Commission and the Public Art Administrator on that, as well as the original artist and the new artist, is and the fire department. Is this a new development, a new division, or? I'm sorry? Is, is this a new division of responsibility, or has it always been like that? You know, I think it's always, um, well, it goes back a number of years, at least probably 30 years or 40 years. I'm not sure. Before that, the Parks Department was a separate kind of, a little bit different organization. And the city, this the city has a slightly different organization than most cities where the Parks Department is slightly autonomous from the rest of the city government. Certainly we still answer to the city council and the, and the mayor, but we also have our own Parks Commission. 
So for instance, when I award a contract, I don't go to city council, I go to the Parks Commission. Um, so there, and the Parks Commission is appointed by the mayor. So there's still a link all the way through, but we, we're not like um, most of the other departments of the city, which are all within what we call the city. Is your record keeping in terms of you know just knowing what you know on, a, on a, any regular maintenance cycle? I mean, is there kind of standard operating procedure that on Tuesdays you do this? And yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, crisis management. Yeah, crisis management. Um, actually, that is one of the things the um, the uh, new uh, guy in charge of the maintenance division is. He's just gotten a whole new computer program set up, and he's um, getting that. Uh, all underway now to get a, like I said, a, a more routine plan for when this is added and when that was done and a, and a better record keeping procedure. We have records of, you know, what was done here and what was done there, but it's all individually organized. You know, you have to know which fountain you're looking for, go look in that file and find that file. Um, so I've been trying to um, get some more of a system like that for the, the monument conservation and the sculpture conservation. And the maintenance division is, is setting that up right now for the more the sort of tangible maintenance issues. Um, when, when are they adding chlorine and how much and that kind of stuff. Uh, I think that traditionally there wasn't a lot of that. Um, you know, the Parks Department used to be, in, in, back in the 70s and 80s, it was a, a kind of a independent group out there doing what they could do, keeping stuff going. And, not a huge amount of uh, sort of interdependent organization. But it has changed a lot in the last 10, 15 years, I think. We had um, a lot of records, for instance, also in, in uh, one of the maintenance buildings, which burned down. So some of that stuff was lost. Um, but now, with the computers and everything, we can keep it in more locations. And hopefully, we won't have that problem again. And one question Is the uh, water quality in the mountains? Uh, determined by health department regulations within the city? In other words, are they, if you make the assumption that you can bathe or drink in it, drink it, or not don't have contact it. dermatitis or whatever, yeah. is, is the addition of the chlorine to, make, to, to suppress bacteria levels? I think there is not um, a specific set of guideline levels that they have to attain at all times, like a swimming pool. Swimming pools have much stricter guidelines. We have started building in the last 10 years or so um, spray rounds for kids to play in. Um, hopefully trying to lure some of those kids out of the fountains and get them to go to the playgrounds and play in those. And those are recirculating systems with really complicated chemical balancing um, technology. And uh, they are also monitored at least several times a day. And they're tested and they have all kinds of nifty stuff. They cost a fortune to build. And uh, we don't have that on the fountains. So the fountains are not, you know, there's no lifeguard on duty. Um, there's signs posted everywhere, please don't play in the fountains, no lifeguard. But um, the chemical, they're not, they're not tested for, for that kind of thing. They are trying to keep the water clear and trying to keep it safe. And when somebody leaves things in the fountain that really should not ever be in a fountain, uh, they drain it and um, clean it out and try to start it up again. And that happens a lot. I didn't go into some of the really disgusting things that happen in fountains. I'd like to is imagine it, that too. Is it against city ordinance to be in fountains? Sure. Just, just check. Yeah. <laughs> it's against the ordinance to drive on the lawn too. It's all the time. But yeah, it is. Um, and the police will shoot them out. But they'll, when the police leave, they will. Right back in? Yeah. Right back. Um, do you have a question back there? Nope. Anything else? Okay, well, I'll be around if you have any other questions. Thanks. Thanks again, Josh. Really appreciated your uh, discussion of your frustrations and successes. Congratulations.